All right. Ready to start? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we have a pretty exciting panel uh, from leading operators. Uh, the topic uh, is all about uh, OpenStack orchestration to support uh, SCN and NFE, and specifically how programmability and automation uh, are going to be impacting the telco networks. Okay? So before I go to the panel, real quick, I want to set the stage. One of the things we have noticed in the last uh, several years is uh, the technology trends. There are many technology trends that's been shaping how we think, how we do business, how we do uh, operations. It's almost like a throwing a rock in the pond. It has created a lot of ripples. And it has given rise to the theories like this, right? Uh, efficiency equal to migrating to cloud, Einstein's second theory. Um, and uh, the social media was completely full of it. The, just to recap the technology trends, we know cloud, right? I mean, in, especially in this community, I mean, everybody knows cloud. And um, cloud has been their own, and key thing that it brings is the rapid elasticity and resource pooling. And taking that concept and applying it to the network functions, more like uh, virtualizing it, uh, which provides you the network function scaling. That's the NFE. And the third one is the SDN, Software Defined Networking, which provides programmability, sort of taking that control and the data plane uh, elements separate, and provides you a common APIs, common programmable interfaces. So these are the technology trends. So what we are going to explore today is about orchestration, okay? All these technologies are really good, but ultimately it comes down to how we can orchestrate. This is just a pretty straightforward uh, definition right from Wikipedia on orchestration. And we would not only talk about this, but also some of the experiences uh, from each of those operators. So having said that, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Swami Vasudevan. Uh, I'm uh, with Ericsson in the SDN NFE Cloud Solutions. And with me, um, I'll go from my right, Avir from Telefonica, and then we have Greg from AT&T, and Fred from Verizon, okay? Um, and what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to ask each of the panelists to talk about how OpenStack is impacting their uh, networks as well as the businesses. Uh, and can we start with Avir? Mike's not working. Mike. It's working? No. It's not working. You want to use it? There you go. That works. Now it's working. Can you hear me? No. No? No. <laughs> what? So. <laughs> you have another panel for me. Yeah. No way. Um, I'm kind of like going about that. No, it doesn't work. Is it on? Yep, that works. Now, uh, it, now it did. I mean, using yours will be a bit awkward, but. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's called uh, an operator it. vendor liaison. Forgetting the things done. So, <laughs> well, some challenges uh, about the orchestration. I mean, the, I mean the, the usage of these technologies, the application of these technologies for the network is. Uh, uh, the, the reason is because we want to increase, uh, I'd say, the the way that uh, the, the freedom that we have, the choices that we have, but also make our life easier and more complicated. And, and, and you know all the um, uh, list of uh, passwords that we all want to use to apply to these technologies. But one thing is what are our expectations, and another is what are the reality. That the reality, by the way, is changing and evolving. But you need to be aware at every single moment what the reality is to be, uh, to have the right level of ambition in each of the stages. 
Uh, we in Telefonica started this journey very early, and actually uh, we had our first BNF. By then, they were not called BNFs, uh, back in 2008. And since then, we have been <laughs> working on this stuff. And, and, and I, I think that we have uh, an informed opinion on, on what are the things that can be done, and we are pretty optimistic on them, and the things that cannot be done yet. So instead of uh, focusing on the things that we can do today, because uh, they are pretty obvious that we can do a lot of stuff, I'll focus on what are the challenges, and what are some challenges that would be great if we could finally be able to, to, to solve. Uh, there are two things that are, we are struggling um, in general as industry uh, related to the orchestration, the way that we do work. One is the, the modeling of the BNFs and the network services. I mean, if we, if we don't have uh, an appropriate description in, in, in terms that can be consumed by a system, then we end up doing things manually. That's what some of the things that we wanted to avoid. And the second is that, in, and, and this is very pertinent in this in this forum is about some of the limitations that uh, that uh, cloud management system have and particularly OpenStack because we are in this forum uh, uh, how, on, on how to deal with data plane workloads and interconnect them successfully so I elaborate a little bit on them sorry for being technical uh, this is uh, what orchestration is from our perspective you have a set of replaceable components and you want to be able to assemble them in an automatic fashion. That is the theory. And you have your PNFs, and you have your network service. That is what you build out of those pieces, those bricks, if you want. And then you have one process, that is the onboarding, where you have uh, new BNFs that you purchase or build in-house that you incorporate into that catalog. And that is great, because if you have some sort of blueprint of what you need to do, then the system will do it on your behalf. That is great, but any resemblance with the reality is merely casual, because actually what we have is, is an uneven modeling of the BNFs, which is in most of the cases inadequate and is uh, uh, completely unrelated even with the development, the things that the developer that was uh, creating that BNF intended to achieve. Then it's not a surprise that the onboarding is hard. And, and then you have a, a, a catalog like this, which is uh, difficult to handle. But hold on, we have the, the, the blueprint for developing the network service, but oh, perhaps it's a bit uh, rough. Hence, it's not a surprise that the integration, ad hoc integration is needed. So with that, if we are lucky, we end up with something like this. So, uh, well, I'm not saying that we are being over ambitious, is that, that we, it's a work in progress, okay? So that is one thing, and, and, and some second point that is related to this one is uh, the connection with the underlay on the things that go on underneath, because the developer all the time had in mind those requirements, where he expected that the, he or she expected that the BNF landed. And, and one of the key uh, features that uh, many of the network elements that deal with, uh, with massive amounts of traffic have in common is precisely the data plane and the data plane workload. And that means that if we want to handle them at, uh, at um, uh, BNF level, we need to make sure that the BNFs are deployed in the manner that were designed and they are interconnected properly so that we don't lose packets in the middle. The funny thing, and that it is the positive thing, is that all the technologies are available at all the layers but in OpenStack. They are available in the hypervisor, in libbeard, even the, in the SDN controllers. All that is ready just to use it. But it's not yet there. In order to make it simple, I mean, what you have is some BNFs that deal with the data plane, and you want to interconnect them. And sometimes you need to interact with external sources or interconnect them in a manner that is as designed by the BNF vendor. The thing is that you need to pay attention to the three aspects, because uh, there's a lot of misconfusion, and I think that we can elaborate later on in the panel session. What is about the resources that are assigned to the VM itself? So it's large enough, has the special type of memory, whatever that it's needed. The way that the interfaces are managed, which is particularly challenging in a cloud management system, because they are more oriented to uh, elements that only have one interface in most of the cases. And then how you handle the, the, the underlay, because many of the connections can go in, in overlay, but many of the connections cannot. 
And the thing is that there are a set, <laughs> there could be more, <laughs> of gaps that are related to this simple picture that are still there and are in the middle of being more ambitious on B NFV deployments on top of OpenStack. So that is the statement. And I uh, hope that we can elaborate later on in the panel session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Greg. Greg, you want to? I do. Your mic is working? My mic is working. I All right. Is okay. it working? <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, my name is Greg Stigler, and I'm uh, AVP Cloud from AT&T. Uh, for those of you who were here at the uh, opening keynote yesterday, uh, I know you saw my boss, Saurabh Saxena, uh, the senior VP over software development and engineering at AT&T. If you didn't see it, I highly recommend it, uh, not just because he's my boss and I'm sucking up, but, but it was really good. It was really good. It tells you a lot about our direction, a lot about where we came from, a lot about where we're going, and a lot about what we want to do. Okay, one of the pieces of that uh, is something that we've released in a white paper to the public called ECOMP. Uh, ECOMP, I'm, let's just not worry about the acronym. It's got a whole bunch of orchestration, owes the orchestration, okay? Um, so it is the orchestration engine that, that we are developing and looking to open source. And like we had 1,700 downloads of this white paper on the first day we put it on our website. So I invite you to go out and download that as well and look to collaborate with us, which is going to be a uh, continuous theme. Uh, can we skip to a different slide or just go blank? Uh, <laughs> oh, I can do it? Okay. It's a strange but has a strange. I had, I had two slides for today, but we cut them and we decided to go unplugged, so, um, which I kind of like anyway. Uh, so, so what I will tell you is that eComp is our foundation for moving forward with orchestration. I will tell you that the initial orchestration is not the hard part, right? Uh, it's once you have something up and running and you want to take action based on the events that take place, that is the key. Uh, so it's getting to those details, and it's not creating a storm as well at that point in time where you, maybe you have a DDoS attack and you start spinning up more VMs or containers and, and you go out, you know, eventually you're going to go out of your data center walls. So that, that's one of the biggest keys is controlling that storm. Uh, from, from the AT&T story, we were a large contributor in the beginning of uh, OpenStack. In fact, we, we were on Diablo. That was also mentioned in the keynotes as, you know, for a couple people that were on Diablo and the pain we went through, whoa, uh, the pain we went through on Diablo. I think somebody hit a switch they might not have hit, should have hit. Uh, but uh, it was nice to see you all. Um, <laughs> So we've got a lot of experience. In fact, we were great contributors back then, tremendous contributors to OpenStack. But what we could not do is deliver something for our business. That was a problem, OK? So we stopped. And we went back and said, what do we need to do to make this right? And really, we, we culturally changed. Instead of living by the Agile Manifesto alone, we added some rigor. My favorite search is Agile Space Excuse. Now, I want to tell you that I'm an Agile fan. Love to iterate. Feel like I've been iterating all my life in IT development, OK? But when you have absolutely no structure with 13 plus scrum teams like we have at AT&T and growing around OpenStack, something this complex, if you don't have a little bit of structure to work this, you're not going to make the end goal. So we put that in, we began to make process on our strategy, we began to deliver, and then in Tokyo last year, I made a promise to the community that, that we were gonna show up in a big way here in Austin, and we were gonna talk about how we are going to contribute. You may be surprised to see an AT&T person sitting next to my friend Fred, and he is a friend now, 
uh, from Verizon. Okay? We want to contribute together. This may be a little bit of back to the future. There were interconnection agreements in the past. We can help each other. That's what open source is all about. Okay? So uh, we want to do that across the globe, not just within the United States as well. In fact, I have a vision that what we will see someday is service providers and large enterprises sharing workloads on their OpenStack powered core, right? So we get the same core, we can share that workload uh, with, with another provider. So if we go to country XYZ and we don't have a facility, rather than build a building, put in hardware, do all the things we have to do, I, want to, I would like to run my workload on, on their cloud and vice versa. We want to make our cloud open. So uh, we are very open, very open source based, um, and we'll continue to follow through with that. And that's our commitment to the community going forward. Uh, problems, Javier mentioned some. They absolutely exist. Uh, I will say the top ones for me is upgradability, uh, Neutron, and why I have to go pay somebody to do overlays, I don't understand. Um, so I, I would really like to see something grow in that area better. And I'll differentiate something here as well. Pure open source versus commercial open source. I don't know if anybody's used these terms yet, but I, but I made them up, at least the, the commercial part. Uh, on the pure side, you would look at people like Mirantis. You would look at people like Ubuntu. And basically, you can download their hardened version from their website. Hardened version from their website. On the other side, and I'm not going to mention them <laughs> by name, you buy a commercial hardened version and you have vendor lock-in because it is not easy to switch to that one that they call open source, okay? It is not easy to switch over to that one because there's a lot of packaging. Uh, there's a lot of issues with doing that. So I would ask the community to put a great focus in this area uh, as something that we could do together and make a difference in this world. So uh, with that, I'll sit down. Thank you for the time. So again, again, thank you very much. I'm Fred Oliveira from Verizon, and uh, kind of, we're uh, good friends now with Greg. Um, again, I, I think we've been uh, Verizon working on a cloud environment for a fairly long time. Uh, we did deploy uh, internally stuff uh, back on Essex stuff uh, way back when. Uh, in the meantime, I, I think it's improved quite a bit, uh, but it still has uh, some pieces that are lacking. Uh, I think you know, Verizon sees this as a, a great opportunity to uh, improve our business efficiency, uh, leverage some of the uh, capabilities that are coming up in the environment, and uh, improve agility and uh, eventually uh, arrive at some operational uh, improvements. Um, there certainly are, again, I'll reiterate the, a lot of the uh, things that uh, Francis Xavier and uh, Greg have uh, mentioned. Uh, there's uh, some, certainly some pieces lacking in the uh, current implementations, both from the uh, uh, VNF vendor perspective, uh, some of the VNFs we get are uh, not really suitable or ready to be run in a cloud environment per se. Uh, orchestration is one of the mechanisms that we use to uh, try to compensate for some of the things that are there, uh, and we're uh, you know, looking to leverage all that capability. Um, again, I'll reiterate some of the things that I've said before. Some of the things that are kind of missing in the, uh, or lacking in the environment are Neutron and uh, kind of uh, packet, high packet rate processing is uh, uh, still in the infancy for us, uh, and uh, we can certainly see some, uh, ask for some improvement in there. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll, we'll switch to some uh, panel questions, and, and I think, uh, I'm hoping like uh, audience have the mic, so we can actually alternate between a question I ask and uh, one from the audience. Uh, this particular question, gentlemen, uh, the, the, one of the things reminds me of is uh, a conversation I had with uh, 
my son. It was a pretty candid conversation uh, about life and death. Okay, and um, so he asked me, uh, "Are we all going to die, Daddy?" And I said, "Yes." Uh, "Are you going to die?" "Yes." Uh, "Are am I going to die?" "Yes." Uh, and um, I asked him, like, why are you asking it? Uh, and the answer he gave me was pretty interesting. He said, uh, when you die, I want your iPhone. Okay? <laughs> All right? So um, the reason he's, he said was because he wanted to uh, do the complete uh, video streaming and online gaming. Um, so interestingly, that puts a lot of pressure on the network and how agile it should be uh, changing as, as fast as it can be. So I want to ask you guys, did OpenStack enable you to deploy new services uh, in a flexible manner, in a faster manner? Uh, and if so, an example. So maybe I'll start from the other side. Fred, you want to go? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's, uh, we're still in the uh, in beginnings of the journey, uh, but uh, we certainly see uh, there's uh, uh, examples of cases where um, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, process that's been involved in actually ac acquiring hardware, uh, uh, planning for something, and then uh, deploying in the various environments, uh, uh, and then enabling things uh, uh, have been considerably improved in by uh, uh, the use of OpenStack, uh, deploying virtual environments, uh, and deploying it on a, uh, a customer uh, at a time basis rather than as a kind of a large incremental uh, uh, service deployment. Um, so I, I think there's uh, certainly in the uh, wireless packet processing environment where uh, I've seen a, a, a rapid enablement a reduction from a um, uh, several months to deploy a new customer service uh, down to you know, more uh, in the week time frame, uh, just going through all the process environment. Okay, Greg, you want to add anything to it? Yeah. Sure. Um, we, uh, six months ago I would not, have, I would have said no. Mike. Now I'll say yes. Um, the no was based on the time it takes to deploy a cloud an OpenStack cloud and the energy and manual nature of that. So as part of Mr. Saxena's presentation in the keynote, he discussed that in the first uh, 10 months of last year, we deployed 20 zones. And those are sites too, same, same thing, okay? Um, in the last two months, we deployed 54. Yeah. And that's all about automation. So that automation making the sites available, both test, dev, and production, has changed the world that we were able to make, you know, at at and that we were able to make this available to our developers and our uh, business users. So that was the most significant move that enhanced the services, and we, we have 17 VNFs coming up this month based on that. So it's very exciting. Good, thank you. How are you? Um, oh, sorry. we'll do this. <laughs> yeah. no? Um, no, sir, did this one work now? No. Yep. Yep. This one? No. Yes. Both. Both? Yes. No. Now. <laughs> yeah, big uh, second. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I can get a microphone from, from there, so you don't need to. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, uh, what I was saying. The <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, of course that's helped us. I mean, we've, um, I, as I said, I mean, we, we are uh, continually recalibrating the level of ambition. I mean, because uh, it's obvious that each technology has a degree of maturity. So if the question is whether we, in the uh, environment that we have over compute nodes, we have uh, improved in the way that we do the, the processes, I would say definitely yes. And actually, we have some uh, large case experiences in South America, where we have a strong presence, as probably many of you know, with the residential market based on x86 uh, processes. The processors, the point is that it's not only about um, the way that you change your operation in terms of uh, what you do with the BNFs, but also the way that you change and you transform 
your relation with the customer, which has uh, changed substantially because of that uh, environment. Uh, that's been the, the main lesson learned for us, is that it's not about the technology, it's not about mm, deploying BNFs fast, it's not about deploying data centers fast, which, by the way, is required, so I'm not neglecting that uh, a challenge. But what is actually challenging is, in, 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 the, in the end, is to be able to change your relation with the customer for the good, if possible. And, and, and leverage on the, the new capabilities that those platforms have in order to be, be faster, uh, be more responsive, and be able to offer uh, things that are that really matter for, for that customer. That is the, the process where we have changed substantially the way that we operated the network, particularly in the, in the places where we have some NFV-related deployments in place. I would like to echo that before we move on real quick because Splitting up the black box is the best thing that ever happened, right? So uh, taking, taking the proprietary hardware, making a commodity hardware, taking the software and, and making it software that runs on commodity hardware. Now, not everybody's got it right yet because it's not native. I think they stripped it off the black box in some cases. Uh, so we need that to be cloud native and written the right way, and we're working with our partners on that. Uh, but, but an absolute huge key to giving the control to the customer to be able to manage and change their services on the fly. I totally agree, Javier. Yeah. I agree with also. And I'll, I'll second that. I think there's a, a lot of the uh, opportunity for this is to be more agile, allow customers more flexibility, more agility, uh, enable services on their own uh, without having to wait six months. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll see if there's one question let's take from the audience. If you have any questions. If not, I'm going to ask uh, another panel question. All right, so one of the things I um, want to uh, ask you guys is uh, what are the key deficiencies of OpenStack uh, that you have encountered in achieving your desired level of automation. Uh, you want to go, Harvey, first? Yeah. Now that I have a microphone, yeah. hopefully it works. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would say deficiencies because uh, I mean I know that they are, all these technologies are in quick evolution, so it would be unfair saying that we perceive them as um, deficiencies. But it's obvious that there are things that are, mm, from our perspective, missing. Uh, which are related to the kind of new set, I mean, with a new set of use cases that we are, as um, sales providers, bringing on top of the table. Uh, and, and many of them have, are related with the IO related uh, workloads, which is not only being successful in the way that you assign resources in a pool, which is, I mean, more or less part of the theory in, 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 in computation, but it's also in the way that you break out those workloads. And, and, and the way that you automate the interconnection of those workloads with the rest of the physical network, because in the end, you end up in a fiber, uh, in a long distance fiber, not in, in a data center fiber. And if you uh, fail on the automation of that last step, you automation very little, because that leads again to a lot of minor, um, manual labor, which is uh, one of the points that you want to avoid. So that is one of the challenges. And the other is once that you can leverage on that, the appropriate modeling, so that you can repeat that process over and over. Uh, you have to consider, in, in our case, the uh, Telefonica is present in, in, in over 26 countries. But obviously, we don't reinvent the wheel in every single country. We sometimes try, but uh, we try to <laughs> make the, the things homogeneous. The more that we can leverage on a, on a single experience, on a single evaluation, a single testing, to repeat it reliably, the more successful we are in, the, in, in, in that replication. And that requires, of course, that automation. So for us, it are key those two elements to give a, a, a step further in, in that evaluation, because in, in that uh, uh, deployments. Because besides that, we have no doubts that uh, the servers are perfectly capable of handling most of the workloads that we that, that we consider as relevant are capable of scaling at the uh, and the locations where we consider that they might get value. We have no questions about the theoretical possibility of automating and, and creating appropriate templates for that, but it's just a matter of the delivery of the last step. And, and we have hope, but we need to keep working on that. Okay. I'm okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I think. Okay. 
the, uh, the first thing I want to say is if you don't contribute, don't complain. <laughs> Seriously. I, I don't mind the complaints. They're, they're okay. But make them constructive and get involved. Okay? That, that's mm -hmm. what really needs to happen. I am so grateful for this OpenStack community for launching what it launched because we could not have done this on our own. There's no way in this time frame we could have done this on our own. So I am so grateful to the community. Now with that said, now that we're getting back in the contribution game and we're doing good, my curve's going up this year, <laughs> I do have a couple things to say. So let's start with the foundation's ratings of some of the modules. Salometer, two out of eight. That's no good. It's got to get better and it's got to get better faster. It's too critical. Okay, the telemetry is too critical to what we do. The ability to have insight into those things has to happen. Okay, so that's one. Containers would be another one. So we're kind of talking about Magnum, we're kind of talking about other mm -hmm. stuff and different ways of doing it. I'm not saying there only has to be one way, but there shouldn't be 20. Okay, uh, we should lock into some things or at least some reusable assets that allow people maybe some freedom to do saying things their own way, uh, but, but it would be limited, but it would be limited. And, uh, and I, I would just have to come back to Neutron again for the last <laughs> time, so anyway. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just bang on Neutron as well. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I think, certainly I think there's, um, uh, uh, again, OpenStack is a, a, a very useful tool in general, uh, and it, but it, and it is one tool. I think it's actually at the incumbent on uh, a lot of the things uh, that surround it to deliver a, a full service. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll reiterate the salometer, I think, and telemetry in general uh, is one of the kind of things that uh, we see as a, a lacking. Uh, and uh, you know, we're, we don't contribute, unfortunately. Uh, but that's certainly some of the areas that we're uh, looking to contribute in terms of uh, requirements and specifications as well as just uh, code. Uh, but I think there is certainly value there and, and uh, things are moving rapidly. Uh, I think there's uh, certainly more and more coming out of it. Uh, from a kind of a specific Neutron thing, I think one of the things that uh, we uh, uh, try to integrate into our network uh, that's not well supported in the Neutron environment is quality of service. And, and how to do uh, bandwidth reservation and, and uh, uh, deployment of uh, the various qualities of uh, and control path traffic that we want. Uh, and that's one of the key areas that we're looking to help in. All right, good. May I add something sure. uh, about the um, uh, contribution topic that uh, perhaps is, uh, is uh, often misinterpreted and I, I'm certain that it's not the case, but I mean, in, in economics, as you probably know, the most valuable is the most scarce. And in, in many cases, uh, there are many types of contributions, which uh, happen that the, in this uh, in this floor are happening in all the levels, almost all the levels. And I, I only can speak on behalf of Telefonica, which has been contributing actively in all the levels, including the software for a long time. But I would say that there are many service providers that can afford contributing directly to the software. And I still have a deep respect for that, and I am particularly uh, want to give a note on the on some service providers uh, who have provided an extensive analysis of what is uh, where are the application and the assessment that they made of OpenStack in some use cases that they wanted to deploy for real in the short term. And um, sometimes it has been misinterpreted, and since it's not uh, in our case, I can say it fittingly as if they were uh, saying that OpenStack was not valid for them, or they gave up with OpenStack. It's exactly the opposite, uh, in my view. I mean, those inputs first, uh, we have uh, perceived in Telefonica as a very useful insight on things that we are not even considered. In use cases that we, are cons we were considering as well for real, and we hadn't even noticed. And second is that uh, for the community that is reasonably IT, related and, and most of the expertise is based on IT. They are extremely useful uh, useful feedback. I, I have in my mind, uh, for instance, the contribution from British Telecom, talking about the, um, the um, uh, C virtual CP for, for uh, uh, enterprise uh, environment, where they made very valid points and perhaps they are not contributing millions of lines of code, 
No one. Or, or they, or they are. But I think that putting in a, in a, in a comparing in weight, in the moment, in this moment in time, what they are contributing in terms of knowledge, is huge and is extremely valuable. And I understand that it should be perceived as something useful for the community and constructive. Um, um, I know that many other service providers are hesitant whether that kind of message would be perceived as a back off from, from, for the uh, OpenStack community or not. And I, I would like to invite you to read them in a different manner, in a, in a constructive manner of bringing them their experience to make things better. Yes, so Great. obviously we disagree to some degree. We, we have a middle ground here. What I will tell you is that we have a small service provider event this evening. I, I can't invite everybody, it's a small <laughs> one. A lot of sea levels, you know, up here. Um, and British Telecom's invited. So we would like to welcome them with open arms. We just want, I, I can pay a consultant for feedback, okay? So we want people with skin in the game and not just blood sucking. So that's about as blatant as I can be. Okay. I guess we are a little bit over time. Can we take one or two questions from the audience? If anyone wants to ask a question? No microphone. <laughs> uh, question for um, well, all three of you, really. Um, you mentioned with VNF vendors that you saw that they weren't maybe quite ready yet, or at least a lot of them weren't ready yet. Mm -hmm. So what are the primary deficiencies that you see with the, uh, the VNF vendors at this point? Well, I'll try to answer that. I think I brought that issue. Uh, so I think the uh, things that we're seeing, and, and this is improving uh, fairly rapidly, but initial set of uh, VNFs that we get uh, were pretty much ports off the direct what they had in, in their hardware environments. Uh, and they're not uh, really set up to be uh, to scale well, uh, to be uh, separately deployed, uh, to handle uh, kind of HA as you would be able to handle it in a, uh, um, a VNF uh, a virtual environment. Uh, I think these things are, again, improving. I think the, uh, a lot of the VNF vendors are, uh, uh, let's say, cloudifying their uh, VNFs to uh, support this. But uh, it's, uh, again, early days for them as well. Thanks. You want to add? So, just a quick question. Um, oh, no. oh, you don't have. Oh. <laughs> yes. um, logistics is getting very complicated. Yes. Um, anyway, now I would like to add a note on the on the BNFs because I think it would be uh, fair for some and fair for others. Uh, uh, we've, uh, as you know, we will, m many of you know because it's public information. We've uh, found a love for BNF evaluation with over fifty. 57 BNFs evaluated so far, and keep counting for many purposes. And I would say that there are two big uh, uh, conclusions from my perspective. One is there's a lot of extremely serious stuff out there. Another that is they have not even given it a thought. It's, and the second thing is that uh, that uh, degree of maturity is surprisingly unrelated to the size or the brand of the vendor behind mm -hmm. is uncorrelated, which means that there are big vendors with big, big with excellent BNFs, big vendors with awful BNFs, and the the other two combinations. Mm -hmm. And and so I mean, we should be able to distinguish and to send the right messages uh, to the BNF vendor community. Or what are the kind of things that we want to see? But I wouldn't be op pessimistic because we are clearly seeing uh, an evolution over the time. On the, maturi on the maturity of the BNFs. Uh, and that is mm, it's, it's worth uh, acknowledging that that effort is happening at the industry level. Okay. It, it's, it's actually happening for all of us, right? It's, it's happening within all of our big businesses where we have to transform. And the same thing is true for the vendors in this case. So um, that's all. Thanks. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we are almost run out of time. Uh, the one thought I want to leave you guys with is um, there was a little boy who uh, goes to a balloon vendor and um, you know, asks if the red balloon is going to fly high, uh, and the vendor says yes. And then he's asking 
whether the green balloon is going to fly high and so forth. Um, the thing is, uh, the, what the vendor said was, it's not about the color of the balloon that makes it fly high. It's actually what's inside the balloon that makes it fly high, okay? And it's you guys, you are the community, and, uh, and the collaboration, that's what makes all of us fly high, okay? So thank you so much, and uh, thank you for all the panelists, and it's a very good uh, discussion. Thank you all.